Hi and welcome to another Business Builders. I'm sat here with my co-host Mark from Market Mavens. I'm John Lydon from Hybrid Anchor. Today we're going to be talking about a niching of your market. So in our industry and in many industries you get like the full service and they cover different areas and there's arguments for and against that. So I thought it would be a great topic to kind of bring up where we can talk about it. So I know from like your background, you are a full service marketing agency. I've kind of taken that other kind of side of the coin, which is to try and niche or mm-hmm. niche, as the Americans mm-hmm. would call it, down into a specific area. Um, with myself, I actually got some feedback on that quite early on, and they says, well, what is your niche? And I'm thinking, I've got really strong views on startup businesses niching too early, uh, which we'll come on to in the episode. But do you want to kick us off on this one, Mark, yeah, and kind absolutely. of get us started? Absolutely. I mean, I, I come across it quite a lot in marketing different companies. They don't actually have a niche or they don't specialise in one specific area. And that is their downfall. You know, when they go like that, oh, well, we, everybody can buy it. And you're like, well, no. <laughs> it's just like, not everybody's going to buy it. You know, not everybody's an audience, absolutely everybody. And you're like... And you have to really nail down exactly who your ideal buyer is. Who's who's your ideal client? Who's your ideal buyer? Who do you not want to work with? Who's the people that? Because we've we've all had that. We've all had like you know bad clients or whatever ones that don't want to pay or you know ones that try to drive down the cost. I say bad clients on a podcast. Oh, uh, I mean, <laughs> they're all good. You're all good clients. Uh, yeah, if you're listening to this, you're a good client. <laughs> but you know there there is there. I mean I'm, I know you say that, but uh, there are there's not. I'm not no, maybe not bad, but not. No, fit. I get it. It's it red, fit. red flags. It's not a good. It's fit. red flags. It's not a good fit for the business. Um, so you don't want ev- you don't want everybody. Um, you want you just want the the right type of people. Um, and essentially, another thing about a niche as well is it helps position you in the market. It definitely, like if you look at marketing agencies, I mean, it must be a minefield for somebody looking for a marketing agency or a, a, oh, digi- a digital agency because there's about a million of them, maybe. Yeah. Trillion. <laughs> uh, even that way, it's like I'll come into contact with agencies and they're like, Have you heard of X? Have you heard of Y? And I'm like, No, how no. long have you been in business? Like, oh, they've been an agency for 30 years. And uh-huh. I'm like, Oh, where are they based? And they're like, Glasgow. And I'm like, Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've never heard of them. Like, And it's almost like they're not marketing themselves. Mm-hmm. So, but it's just because where I'm looking, that's not where they're showing up. Mm-hmm. So in the circles I'm moving in, those aren't. Prevalent, whereas yeah. in other circles are probably like shouting really loudly. Yeah, and it, and it's exact exactly the point. So I, I I do find it so I do find it quite difficult, and I'm trying when we do our marketing workshops, I'm really trying to delve into this because it bases the success 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 of our marketing. Because if we don't market them properly and really niche down in a, a specific area, it won't work. You, I mean, you'd have to have an endless budget to market to absolutely everybody as well. Um, so I don't think a lot of people understand and, and, and really kind of nail down that. I think that they're like, they're scared. There's probably a bit of a fear. Oh, if I don't do that... Cutting away a market. I'm, go- I'm not going to get any money from... What if, what if I'm like, I'm going to miss out in that business? But no, what if you actually focus in this specific area and do it really well and get your case studies and your testimonials and then become the go-to for that then you're going to make a lot more money, you know, because it's... Yeah, it's, it's having that confidence, isn't it, to yeah. push into the niche. Yeah. It's the, it was funny, I met a guy, um, fairly new to kind of setting up a business, and it's like, say you're like an accountant, so like an accountant you'll say like, so who's good for you? What's a, what would be a great business for you to do business with? And they're like, eh, anyone. And then I always used to answer that kind of, a bit coy, but being like, I don't know anyone called anyone, you know, like, uh, you know, <laughs> any specifics? No. And you're like, so you, like, you can have anyone in the world and you don't know a name, you don't know a company that you would want to work with mm-hmm. uh, is the first thing. And then you get the permutations of that. So like there's a guy I know, um, he's, a, he's, he's in business is called Big Bobo Hats. So it's these like big yeah. puff hat things. It's really, really cool. Um, but he says that, he says, I'm looking for people with a head. You know, or like an optician, I'm looking for people with eyes. Uh, and it, like, it's, it's kind of funny and it makes you think, yeah, like, it could literally be anyone, but I think it's much more powerful if you kind of like work out like who's that persona, who are you trying to t- uh, mm-hmm. talk to? I remember when I first set up, I was having that chat with you going, you know, I need to kind of work out who this persona is. Yeah. Like, who are we actually selling to? Um, and I, I would say that 
I wouldn't say I had one specific niche as such. Um, I would love to have that. And like obviously with other businesses, it's quite clear like that's our focus. Um, but I've kind of had like right, e-commerce because it's a kind of background. I've had software, again, strong background. So software and e-commerce. And I'm on the more technical end of like the agency scale. So if you imagine it like a, a line, so you've got super creative, really fun, you know, the reflection of the moon's inspire and the feng shui tells me it should be a blue triangle. That's about as far removed for me as far removed can get. Yeah. Whereas if it's like, um, actually, this is actually causing you serious conversion issues with yeah. the speed of the website or the way this is integrating is not correct. It's not talking to that service. Mm. That's much more where I'm at home. So it's almost our positioning is like far right on the technical scale, mm -hmm. but we are creative. So it's not like that we don't have designers. Yeah. And, but I think some people take that and they go, oh, so you just do the coding? And you're thinking, well, well no. <laughs> like we, we actually do design, we do it really well. Mm -hmm. But I'm not really interested in trying to have a great looking design. I'm interested in trying yeah. to build a performing tool. Um, but I've been asked that, like, you know, should you not just niche down and say, right, we only build websites for um, like tool retailers or mm. we only do e learning for government or something like that? And I, I can understand the rationale. And I, I do have that fear, if I'm really honest about it, thinking, what if you do hyper specialize and yeah. then the market just kicks away? And it's, I kind of found that recently where we used to service quite a lot of um, travel agencies. Like, um, and I don't mean like you go and book your holiday. I mean like people that do like the bookings at scale. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're kind of big travel companies um, that are booking flights and packages and stuff like that. But their market completely fell away. So think about it, they are super niche. Mm -hmm. And I was told that by a really senior individual in that sector. And they said, I think you're making a mistake. Mm -hmm. I think you should really set, sort of specialize like us, we travel. And I'm thinking, that sounds like sound advice. You know, it, it did, it, mm -hmm. you know, and up until recently, it would have been very true. But then look at what happened to travel and hospitality now. Doing cool, so it's yeah. like, right, so what's your answer to that? And those companies were bleeding like mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of pounds because they were so hyper-focused on travel. Mm -hmm. Now, will travel come back? Of course, it'll come back. Yeah. However, what happens if it doesn't come back very quickly or it never returns to what it was? Because what I hear when I think about that now is, British Steel, you know, British yeah. Steel, man, British Steel. And you're thinking, well, they maybe thought it'll bounce back or rebound, but mm -hmm. it didn't. It just went to Asia, and it's now, like, kind of done in, like, Hyundai Shipyard or mm -hmm. um, Taka Steel or whatever. It's done somewhere else. So the market shifts, and I think if you're hyper-specialised in an area, you invite yourself to risk. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't. But I would probably follow a, an 80-20 rule. I yeah. always think you should have a couple of aces in the hole. And if it's like that falls away, you yeah. push forward with another card. And that's exactly the thing. It's, that's a, I think that's a bit of a scenario planning and having also aspects of additional revenue. We both are exactly, we don't have one just revenue. We, we get revenue from multiple different aspects. And that's because we're just good business people. And because we, we know that. And that's, I, I think... Yes, if somebody puts all their eggs in one basket, then that is a risk. You have to have extra parts where it can like go down the route of one and then go, if something pulls out, you're like, oh, I need to now jump jump to that. Um, so walk me through that process. And so I, I know what you're alluding to there because I know you, but for the benefit of people listening to the podcast or watching the podcast, walk me through that scenario. So obviously you're known as a marketing agency. So the classic... Um, websites, marketing campaigns, you know, like really good sort of solid marketing advice and consultancy. But how have you protected yourself then? So I would say that your niche is marketing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, obviously you do a wider set of things, but that's kind of like your core where yeah. I can see it. But how have you kind of protected yourself as your revenue streams? Well, that's the thing. So obviously doing marketing training as well. So doing marketing training workshops, um, I take a bit of revenue from that. I've also got revenue coming from like other aspects as, as well from equity and like different businesses yep. things taking dividends out, out of other uh, other businesses um that's essentially kind of helped me get me don't get me wrong like i think what people will probably think you know my agency is not kind of specialized because it is like an all-in-one marketing so a lot of people go well you know other marketing agencies they just do google ads or they just do social media but the way that I kind of see it is it's it's a results-orientated business and we do have lots of skills. 
but just because you come on we're not going to give you every single one of them we're going to give you one that suits you best so if somebody comes on and you know all they need is just a website then that's all they're going to get um but i sort of you know going again going through the kind of covid situation i've seen businesses that are specialized in one specific area and i think i was quite good because I saw my, at the time I saw myself as like sector agnostic and I was like, oh yeah, I could, you know, we're doing it to, you know, multiple different sectors. But actually when on reflection and really kind of delving into it, and actually we've been talking about this more in our marketing, is we don't do that. There is a, a specific niche and, and it has always been from the start of the company, is that we focus on startups and scale-ups. Now it was tech startups and scale-ups for a long, long mm-hmm. period of time. Um, but it generally is now like startups and scale-ups and that is really kind of you know we talked about culture it goes all the way down to the culture as well of like they grow together and um, these companies are a, a smaller budget or they're a smaller size company we help them grow and most of the time cl- the clients leave us now is um when we have basically grown them to the point where they go we're going to scaled out of that solution we're going to hire our own marketing team now we don't, we don't I think that's to. often the best reason for somebody to leave though is that, uh-huh. that to me that doesn't feel like I, that they're leaving because they're upset they're leaving because organically they have now grown to yeah. a much more stable it's yeah. kind of like a staff member as well I kind of look at it as it's like a it's a window like mm-hmm. so we support a client maybe for you know two years six mm-hmm. years ten years but if we're honest about it and the company wants to grow it should naturally sort of kind of go to a point where they're going it would probably be cost effective to start mm-hmm. building at least part of an internal team mm-hmm. and then longer term yeah. they kind of do that that always interests me and that's probably the only type of exit that I look at and I think I'm kind of glad that happened because it's like a maturity in the market and then they're almost like one of your success stories like yeah. we were there when they started or quite it, recently it's, um, um, it's, it, and you it, see their kind of growth and you're thinking it's brilliant to even just you know, I, I'm not arrogant in the sense of like we did that. No. The business owner did that. But yeah. it's, um, when I look at kind of businesses like that, like we've got a, a client, um, Sean Cameron, he has an asbestos business. And it has him. And I think when I first met him, just a young guy, really passionate about what he did. I had him, maybe another guy or two in a van. And mm-hmm. that was it. He had no logo, no website, no nothing. And then we kind of worked with him. And it's like recently he came back to me and he's like, would you design me a logo for my group? And for my EV installation business, and I'm I'm always nosy. I'm like, you know, what's going on now? You know, like what's going on with the business? And he's like, oh, it's amazing, mate. I've got like seven vans in the road and a big warehouse, and he's bought the warehouse mm-hmm. and all that, and he bought a new house, and he's, um, him and his missus are doing really well, and they've got this kind of group going. And I thought it's just bloody inspiring, man, to see like. So we had, you know, their website, their logo, some social media, a brochure. But he's kind of taking those tools and he's running with them. And mm-hmm. I think like that becomes your success stories. They become the ones you're going, it doesn't matter like whether they've kind of like naturally kind of done that. So they've went away, they come back. Mm-hmm. They, and that's cool. You know, it's completely cool. But I love seeing that kind of journey, you mm-hmm. know, where they've kind of like really pushed Absolutely. it. Absolutely. It gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling. Like um, we had a company and um, it basically was like, had, he had £10,000 in his bank account. And he's like, I'm going to spend this in marketing. Um, you know, please help me as much as you can. And we got really, really quick, like, it was sort of me, I was working on the account, and I got them, like, page one within a month or something like that for their keyword, but it's just the magical keyword. So the leads just poured in and poured in and poured in. And I think in, like, a year, he's, like, £2 million pound turnover or something like that. Some crazy. And then he's, like, now... For ten grand, I'll give you ten grand. Uh, right now. But he only, that's when he only had ten grand, grand at the time. So he was, Aye, he's, he's, reinvest, he's reinvesting he's, it back in. He's still on it. Yeah, he's still in a monthly retainer, yeah, uh, so. even to this day. But I, it's funny, like I was, I, I was I me watching your back there, so that people I listening aren't going. So if I give him ten, 10 grand, ten grand, million, you know, you know, uh, and setting expectations. Well, like, no, but he's um, he's now like you know driving about with like, multiple different vans, and it's great. I'd, like I, that's one of the things I'll say to the kids, and I'm like that, you know, dad. Dad helped that do that. Dad came up with that name and he, and like designed the logo and all that. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you told you told us you told us. So are we going for a happy meal? Uh, you know, well, <laughs> but I'm I'm dead. It's a, it's a big deal. It's like uh, Anchorman. I'm a big deal. Uh, like I'm dead proud. But then in the in the flip side, I work with like large multinational corporations, 
um, you know, massive company, you know, some of the biggest companies in the UK. And I just, I just feel like a number. Like we've been doing, we do some great stuff. You know, you know, for instance, we're marketing for the National Trust. Basically, took one of their, so it was one of their sites at National Trust. Basically, took their Facebook following from like, I think like two people to like over four thousand five hundred people in like a very very short space of time, like less than a month, and um, just creating brilliant content, engaging with the social media content, and it was just kind of, oh, that's nice, you know, like it doesn't register the same way. It did, and and, it, and, and it's it, like a lot of companies that kind of focus on it. So you said something interesting at the start there. You were saying like startups and scale ups. I would help a startup, but I wouldn't say they were our focus area. So I'm mostly interested in scale up. Yeah, the ones so that want to grow. Yeah, so it's like I want somebody that wants to put like their own kind of mark and be like the person mm-hmm. that does this. Because um, I've looked at it like we were lucky enough to have about forty two blue chips, mm-hmm. um, and you're thinking it was great. You know, it's interesting, but it's literally your pound of flesh my god you work for those clients and uh-huh. they're very demanding they've got their own internal resources and everybody's yeah. sniping each other and trying yeah. to kind of like point score and you yeah. know you're going to be the fall guy more often than not because you're the, yeah, the supplier absolutely. and stuff like that uh, and then startups it's the other way where they don't have two nickels to run the girl and it's going oh, whatever this whatever that and you're thinking right that's quite a lot of expectation getting put in that 20 pound yeah you know that's is that realistic like you're not going to have a five thousand percent growth on 20 quid mm-hmm. like you know it just doesn't happen if i could do that you know i'd be out selling magic beans and doing yeah. it for myself but realistically if you can get a kind of good return i found that like the kind of scale up market seems to be where we focus so i try to find companies that have got maybe three to five employees as a kind of minimum and then obviously we'll support larger than that as well but the kind of niche or what the area of interest to me, and I don't really know you could even call it a niche, but it's complexity. That's what I like. I enjoy non-standard work or weird work, you know, yeah. in the sense of, I mean, my team probably hate me for that, to be honest with you. They, um, if you're listening to this, you can tell me if you hate me. But they, <laughs> <laughs> they have like, so I'll bring in these projects where you'll be working for, let's say, a funeral planner and you have to like work out how do we sell these packages and upsell but we can't really promote because there's compliance or there's different regulations yeah. or there's standardised ways that this information needs to hit the CRM mm-hmm. and there has to be like triggers and alerts. And I just love the brutality of a really complex puzzle yeah. being placed on my desk and it's kind of like, it's quite clear how you render the benefit back. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, say you're doing like a Rubik's Cube, you know when you've solved it. And I think with those kind of clients if you kind of crack that egg and it's like right this is what we built together it becomes quite a cool thing Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas sometimes it's like oh could you do us a cool logo cool you do a cool logo yeah you do us a wee brochure you do a wee brochure and they look good don't get me wrong they're they're stunning assets but it's not super compelling Mm -hmm. sort of challenge and work and I think you can't be in challenge 24 7 Mm -hmm. but that's the kind of like niche area I've tried to find is one I think the projects are more interesting but I've also kind of noticed that we kind of hold an edge in that space because we're so deployed against complexity Mm -hmm. that when we get a project like that I think that we really shine Mm -hmm. as like a solutionist because it's like right let's break it down can we do this can we do that and they'll say to me they'll be like you sound like so different to the other agencies that we spoke Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. because you can tell it's just like a big puzzle so you're like kind of like Michael Schofield in Prison Break, like trying yeah. to like mind map your yeah. way through this spaghetti. Um, and I think that that's been quite good. Whereas, realistically, if you said to somebody, I want a standardized business website, so it's like client X, they want a business website, and you ask, say, 20 agencies, it's kind of hard to be unique mm-hmm. because largely we're all rendering the same service, oh, albeit we render in a slightly different way or different mm-hmm. process, but you know, apples for apples, at a certain scale, a lot of agencies are kind of similar. And what I've noticed is that's eroding the kind of value of the service. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's actually one of the biggest advocacies for a niche is to protect your kind of profit margin. Mm-hmm. So let's say graphic design. You can get graphic design on Fiverr or yeah. your printer probably has a graphic designer. Like It's relatively cheap to get, even though it's a skill. Whereas if you were to say to somebody like, do you know React Native? They people get big salaries, but therefore mm-hmm. you can hold a command in a sector mm-hmm. for 
quite a pricey kind of project. Yeah. And it's but niche and that's in like that. a niche as well. Niche and well, niche in that. Well, that's a niche in the skill, isn't it? Like mm -hmm. a, and it's another way of protecting you for your yeah. revenue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and I, as I have seen, you know, in marketing agencies, it's funny. Like we all know a, a company, Clipboost, and I, I remember speaking to as a client, and um, they were like, they're, they're doing a really, really good job with Google Ads. But the client was like that, oh, can you do more stuff? Can you do SEO for me? And they're like that, no, we only do Google Ads. That's, yeah, all we, that. that's what we do. And then you've got like Chris Torres. So he was like Sensi Digital and Dojo Design Studio before that. And then he's totally changed to like tourism marketing agency, just completely tourism. Um, with that as well, so I think that has I think that was a brave I think that was a brave one because obviously then with COVID it just hit there. Um, obviously like, tourism is always it's always flying, no pun intended. You know, like everybody was like, you know, yeah. everybody was you know going holidays, but you I think take COVID away, you've got scenario planning that you can do a lot of things. As I said, where you can look to get additional bits of revenue from elsewhere. But that you didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, it could have hit. It could have hit anybody. And I, I literally thought, um, you know, business is going to be dead because marketing always gets hit. Ah, it's one, to, it's one of the first, first things first to get cut. Oh, when you're kind of there, which uh, is kind of it's kind of silly in a way. Uh -huh. I always look at that a bit like um, if you're going to make redundancies, why would you go for your salespeople first? Yeah. Are you mad? Yeah. Like the salespeople so, are the people feeding the company. Yeah. And it's like you could probably like coast by with a slightly less production mm -hmm. stuff, but if sales are gone, mm -hmm. you're kind of just amplifying your problem. Abs it's, it's absolutely, you've got a customer service. I mean, because you, 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 that's the thing, you got a customer service team or whatever, they're like they're a development team, but you really need you really need that kind of top of the funnel. You need the marketing and the sales to actually like drive and get more. That, that's how I prioritise it. I think it's um, marketing and sales is number one. Mm -hmm. And then like for keeping, and then it's production because you need to be able to do the work. But it's like if you, you can basically sell yourself at any problem. So regardless of what happens to your business, you can generally sell your way through mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And then you can build the production or tweak the production yeah. for what you need. But what you'll find is companies, I mean, it's a heavy pivot. I, I don't know how I would have felt if I was Chris. And it kind of reminds me that I should probably talk to him and see how they did find that, like what mm -hmm. their pivot was and how they've kind of handled that. Because um, I remember like when they first set up, and it was cool because Chris... Chris is quite similar to me in his interests, like I've had dinner with him and stuff like that, quite an interesting guy, but he's like obsessed by like Japan and anime and yeah. you know, like all that kind of culture and he's got like the, the fridge with the hand solo and all this yeah. kind of stuff, but it was almost like the agency went through this kind of strange transition and I kind of, I couldn't, I was trying to ask him over dinner, but I couldn't get to the end of like why that happened. But he was basically directed to like not have that, like so let's, let's lose all the toys, mm -hmm. let's lose all the Star Wars kind of stuff. Um, the posters on the wall should be about travel. The books on the bookshelf should be about, um, you know, like National Geographic or you know. Yeah. And it's like, it's all, like it is the brand maturing, but it's also a departure from what that company originally mm -hmm. was. And I kind of like that about companies. Like you know, I like it when I go to your office. It's like you know the VIO and mm -hmm. there's there's things like that. And I'm I'm big on that as well. I like seeing that kind of mark. Um, you know, I remember one of the first times I went to go and see. Uh, made brave as well they had like the guitar with the backlight and all yeah. and you're thinking it is a cool vibe i can understand why people they like it yeah. you know but even their new office that feels like a totally different business to that kind of underdog grimy mm -hmm. sort mm -hmm. of thing um, and there's nothing wrong with it it's still like a massive yeah. it's a great business but i kind of remember that where it's like the lights are all dimmed and yeah it's secondary lighting and there's an atmosphere you know that way you walk into like a nightclub or a you know, like a, a restaurant, and you're thinking there's just like a it's a cool feeling, yeah, yeah. and, and I kind of like it when brands do that. So I'm like, I'm thinking to like neuter a brand or to, mm. you know, kind of like say right, no, we have to be this now. So it'd be like me going right. Well, we work with pharmacy, so we'll we'll do it up like a clinic, and I'm going, yeah. no, I don't want to work in a clinic. <laughs> I want to yeah. work in a I want to work in a space where I feel comfortable and yeah, you know, I think it's okay for business owners to put their own yeah. personality on it. And that's it, and that's that, that's essentially what. Kind of can niche them as well, and I think, I think it's important for people to understand and be niching and specialising. You know, you can do it for, via an industry, you can do it via skill, um, you know, you can do it just even with your brand and your personality and all that sort of stuff. But ultimately, I think you, you know, you you need to understand 
is it the customers want or customers need, you know, mm -hmm. from it? And how much of a, an addressable market is it from, from that aspect of it? Because that's the fear. The fear is that they go, oh, if we just go and do, do websites only and we're just going to design, you know, really good websites, I'm going to miss out on all this marketing. I'm going to miss out. Well, I would market. say that. Imagine, like, so some of the clients I've got are really sort of different to each other. And I'm like trying to think of the scenario of like, would that client have still came to us if we were yeah. what it is? Like the most obvious one would have been us just to go purely in e-commerce. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I like e-commerce, I've got a lot of experience in it, but actually I enjoy learning a lot more because it takes me closer to educators. So people yeah. like you, people like me, like coaches, consultants, I like working with people like that. Yeah. But then would I want to kind of turn away software where it's, you know, it is more complex. I just couldn't see myself doing yeah. it. And I did think about it in the sense of, you know, the other idea, of course, is to create, like, a splintered brand. Yeah. So you have, like, right, um, hybrid anchor is, say, e-learning, and then, like, uh, something else, like, you know, Chaos Digital is, is yeah. web apps, and, yeah. you know, you know something like, uh, what do you call it, like, whatever, just random, like, spinning puzzle is social media like so you come up with these brands yeah and they belong to a family and i think that is one way of addressing that i've seen a few agencies go down that route um but i think it's just hard because you you lose that coherence in the mm -hmm. sense of like it doesn't feel yeah like mark because it's like well what one's the really one you're passionate about because yeah. you're going to have a favorite you know i mean you're yeah. going to have like right that's the one yeah because when i so, started so. when i started it was definitely tech start start up scale up that was because mm -hmm. i worked for lots of tech companies um, I love tech. I just, I just, and it was just it excites me. But as it's, it's an evolution. I think as you go on, it was like then one of the tech companies would tell somebody else, or somebody would find out about me, and I then take the same process that was successful because it's all about generating results, and I generated results from another company, and then I'm like that. So it's still a start up and scale up, and I've managed to do it for I don't know like double glazing company for instance and I'm like well is it do you need to just focus on tech and tech only we still do there's still I would probably say maybe 80% are still tech companies that, that we that we work with you know software or hardware or whatever um, but there's that other kind of 20% I would probably say I've kind of toyed with the idea of just going we only do B2B um, I would probably say that we're about 90% B2B there's probably like two clients that would do is B2C so probably, you know, maybe, you know, as I go down the line, just go, you know, only work with, you know, B2B uh, business business. B2 startups and scale-ups, you know, and that, that that's really kind of niching it right down. Um, but I kind of, it's, it's, as you say, you let that, but then we don't want to, like, not do work. Sometimes yeah. it, it, it excites you, you know, we've worked with some e-commerce companies and you get, like, brilliant sales and it's cool and... You get like the wee bits with the fashion. It's cool and I do and enjoy it. So well, it's when you see people reach out to you, you're thinking, "Wow, I didn't think that brand would yeah. like kind of reach out to us for a project." And I, I've had that a few ones. Like, uh, was it like Glen uh, Glen Karen's uh, glasses reached yeah. out, and it was like, "Oh, it's like a really famous kind of like whiskey kind of like." But it's like a brand that I wouldn't have thought about, mm -hmm. um, and we didn't end up getting the business for them, but. It was definitely like a fit there. We could have done something. Yeah. And it's almost like a, oh, I quite like to have them. But yeah. after a certain point, it's kind of like, part of that is like, I'd just love to work with these kind of brands. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it is that way. You get your fair share of what you're kind of like geared up to deal with because that's where you find that fit. Yeah. Like, is it right for them? Is it right for you? Yeah. Um, and there could be different reasons. Their budget isn't high enough. Yeah. You're maybe not deployed against what uh -huh. it is or you're thinking mm, that's a conflict to another client we've yeah. got you know like and i think that and i think that's you kind of touched on it earlier on with startups i think that sometimes i find of what my problem with startups like they are literally living just paycheck to paycheck paycheck yeah. to paycheck if they're even getting a paycheck uh -huh. and it, yeah and but that's why it's a little bit different with like scale ups or a startup that's trying to grow that's got like a bit of money and they want to get to the next stage um, you do need to have something an investment so like for instance that company was like there's £10,000 we need to do something with it not that everybody's like £10,000 it's like we've got a budget we're going to try and like work with it but it was kind of like we didn't get something in the first three months it was make, make a break for him really he was probably going to go right we'll end that as project that didn't work but he was like willing to go right, let's just go for it and see I'd it, take a and, it and, and it worked Um. But I've worked with other ones and it's like, oh, and then 
you know, we now you, we can see that we're, something's working. We now need to, you know, add more budget to really, really let it scale here. Oh no, I'm scared. I'm too, I'm too, what, like, too worried about spending that money. But we're already proven that we're getting some leads from it. If we actually like invest a little bit more, you're going to end up you know, Aye, being able to it. Um, and then you've got you've also got like people that and we've talked about it people that kind of follow up sales that's another thing that's not, <laughs> you're like so we've generated the 15 leads oh we didn't follow them up so we didn't get it this is going to there's a, there's a bit broken in the, but the you cycle you must be really rubbish at marketing because they didn't just convert themselves and <laughs> that's not how it works I don't know. I know. You, you still have to do things you know? <laughs> so wrapping up there um, what's your business belter for today? I would say don't cave to pressure so people will say to you you need a niche mm-hmm. and I think that Yes, I understand the kind of principle of it. And I think if you don't feel comfortable being in a niche, there's also counter arguments to not do it. Mm-hmm. If you decide you want to be in a niche, I would say that you kind of temper it with an 80 20 rule. So, yes, that could be your main focus. That's what your company does. But don't be scared to kind of like try other things. Um, if the pandemic has taught anything, it's exactly that. There's services that I push more heavily now because we're in a kind of pandemic world than what I pushed prior to the pandemic. Mm-hmm. If it kind of returned closer to what it was, I would go back to pushing my best sellers on my yeah. projects like that. There's always going to be work out there, but it makes no sense to tether yourself to a service area that's struggling. Mm-hmm. So if your business was given steel companies consultancy when British Steel got like caved, mm-hmm. it wouldn't make any sense. Right now, if it's kind of like travel, the travel industry is hurting, so it's like finding something else you can deploy your kind of skills and your assets. If that bounces back, it rebounds. Great, it's still mm-hmm. going to be there. You still want to be a specialist. You've not lost your knowledge. Um, but I think picking a niche is a dangerous thing if you do it too early on in your business, mm-hmm. and you kind of pick the wrong area. Because I kind of do feel that it's like a, it's an all-in betting poker. You know what I mean? Occasionally, you're going to hit a certain. Mm-hmm set of cards where the person's going to like school you on why that was a mistake mm. and I think the market's the thing that dictates I'm actually quite comfortable for the market to pull me into a niche mm. and then if I enjoy it and enjoy the type of work I'll do more of it mm. and then at that point you can kind of just consider would we classify that as a niche cool and then yeah. you can like build up around it yeah. would be mine what about yeah. you what's your business built for yeah, my business built would be um Similarly, we talked about in the last podcast is like when you're doing your mission and vision statement, you really should, you should be understanding where you're wanting to go. So if it is website design, if it is like focus on a specific area, um, you know, you're good at what you do, you're good at, you're passionate about what you're, you're, you're doing. Um, and that's where I would then understand if, you know, your niche, I think you have to, there's, there's probably a varied level of niche and specialism as well. I would probably say that we do focus, we are we do have a niche and we are kind of, kind of specialist. Um, but I know that there's a lot of people that will just do absolutely everything for everyone. I think if you're that aspect of everything to everyone, it's going to be hard. Um, is that kind of spray and pray approach? You're just looking to see if something is going to stick. So I would I would and would recommend to have that kind of laser focus and try to try to have a, a niche in a specific area. I think you. I think it'd be wary to do it in an industry because if you do, did do a travel, you, even a tech, if you did do something, it could totally fail. So maybe look more to your skills and more to what you can actually do and what you can actually bring to the table. Because, like, you know, agencies that are good at Google Ads and that's all they do is Google Ads. It's because they're good at it. Don't just go out and go, oh, because there's lots of business down there on SEO, we're just going to start learning how to do SEO because you're not going to do it as well. If you're really good at that and you just generate loads and loads of leads for people doing Google Ads, then just keep on doing doing that niche. So that would be my business better. Okay, so wrapping up there, thank you very much for tuning in again today. Um, we were talking about identifying your niche and your specialism. Um, it would be really good again for the community to share you know, what they do in their business. I know that a lot of you have already kind of done it in the, in the past in some of the comments. So if you can actually share, you know, what your process was, you know, did you actually create a niche from day one or did you do it, did it evolve down the line based on, like, you know, your customer success and things? It'd be really interesting to, to hear about that. Um, and again, if anybody wants to share their tips and their business belters, they would be much appreciated. So thank you very much. And it's a goodbye from me. Goodbye for him.
See you guys.